order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr James Berry. Yeah. Question one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr James Berry. Yeah. Yeah. The great British jobs boom has earned the Prime Minister and the Chancellor the admiration of leaders the world over and the support yeah. of my constituents. Yeah. Yeah. Would my right honourable friend agree that businesses in Kingston and Surbiton could create even more jobs if we had better train services and particularly <laughs> Crossrail 2? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, let me, let me start by welcoming my honourable friend after his excellent election result. He's right to say that we have had something of a jobs boost in this country with more than two uh, million more people in work. In his constituency, for example, the claimant count has fallen by 48 per cent since 2010. Our manifesto made clear we will push forward with plans for Crossrail 2 and we're working with Transport for London on a detailed business case. And let me take this opportunity to praise everyone who's been involved in Crossrail 1. The Secretary of State for Transport and I were in those tunnels a week ago. The tunnelling phase is complete. It lasts for 26 miles across London. It is a feat of great engineering and it's going to be brilliant for our economy. Yeah. Last night, the House agreed that there should be an EU referendum, but it's got to be. But it's got to be in the right way, and it's got to be fair. Firstly, the issue of who can vote. Why won't he let 16 and 17 year olds vote? future of our country. They did in the Scottish referendum. It's their future too. Well, well, first of all, can I thank the Honourable Lady and all those Labour MPs who joined us in the division lobbies last night. After, after five years of opposing a referendum to watch them all trooping through, it was it was the biggest mass conversion since that Chinese general baptised his troops with a hosepipe. It was uh, very impressive. On the issue of 16 and 17 year olds, I believe this House should vote on that issue. The Conservative manifesto is clear, and my position is clear. I think we should stick with the current franchise and 18. But the House of Commons can vote. Harriet Harman. Can I just say, in his initial response to my question, that he won the election. He's the Prime Minister. He doesn't... He doesn't... He doesn't... So he doesn't need to do ranting and sneering and gloating. He can just answer the question. And, frankly, he should show a bit more class. to see a yes vote. He and I both want to see a yes vote, but it's essential this referendum is fair and seen to be fair. So why are they changing the law to exempt the government from the rules which are there to ensure the government doesn't inappropriately use public funds or the government machine in the short campaign? Will he think again about this? I think the, the Honourable Lady is right. There was an excellent debate last night and a lot of important issues were brought up and they can be discussed uh, when we have the committee stage of the bill. Let me uh, answer very directly this issue of PERDA because I think all the concerns that were raised can be addressed. There are two reasons for uh, looking very carefully at this and for taking the proposals that we put forward. First of all, as the Europe Minister said, because the European issue is so pervasive, I don't want us to be in a situation where in the four weeks before a referendum, 
Government ministers aren't able to talk about the European budget, make statements about European court judgments, respond to European councils and all the rest of it. That does seem to me a very real danger, uh, and that is what the European minister said out last night. The second issue I, I, would, I would raise, and I think this is a bigger issue, which is that, look, when the negotiation is complete and the government has a clear view, I don't want us to be neutral on this issue. I want us to speak clearly and frankly on this issue. And frankly, when it came to that Scottish referendum, I actually felt in the last few weeks before the referendum, actually the UK government was often being advised it couldn't take a view on the future of the UK. And I think that was a ridiculous situation, which is why we have put forward the change to the Perda rules. But it's an important question she raises. It will be debated in the House. But I've set out the position as I see it. But the problem is, it's not a change in the rules, it's a blanket exemption. And we must have a legal framework on the face of the bill. We cannot be left just to rely on ministerial restraint. Um, now, the Electoral Commission have said the referendum shouldn't be on the same day as any other election, and we strongly agree with that. This is an important constitutional issue that should be considered on its own. Will he guarantee that there will be a separate voting day for the referendum? Well, again, the Honourable La right Honourable Lady is raising an important issue of process and procedure that should be debated and discussed in this House. That my, I'll, I'll tell you exactly my view in, in two seconds. My, my view is... My, my, my view is that the, refer the timing of the referendum should be determined by the timing of the renegotiation. When the renegotiation is complete, we set a date for the referendum. I don't myself think it should be determined by the timing of other elections. We were po it was quite possible to have, for instance, the AV referendum and other elections on the same day. I think people are capable of making those two decisions. But as I say, the timing of the referendum should be determined by the timing of the negotiation. That's the clear principle. Harriet Harman. Talking about the timing of the referendum, apropos of the renegotiations, we're talking about whether or not it should be the same day as other elections. And he mentioned the AV referendum, and I think that we would agree with the Electoral Commission that it wasn't right that it was held actually on the same day. But, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we'll have the opportunity to look further at these issues in the G7 statement that's coming next. So I'd like to turn to an issue which is important to many families across the country. Before the election, the Prime Minister promised that his tax-free childcare policy would be launched this autumn. Is he on track to meet that promise? It's a very important principle we're introducing, which is that if families spend up to £10,000 on childcare, they should be able to get £2,000 back. This is, a, this is a government for working people who wants to help people with the costs of childcare. Not only are we doing that, and the Chancellor will set out the timing of the introduction in his budget, but we're also doubling to 30 hours the number of hours that people will get if they have three and four year olds. This government's determined to act for working people. It doesn't help working people to make promises and then not meet them. Um, let, let me ask him about another election promise. We know that childcare providers already have to increase their fees to parents who pay for additional hours above the 15 hours they get free. Given the free entitlement is going up to 30 hours, how can he guarantee that families will genuinely benefit from this and won't just end up being hit by increased fees elsewhere? Well, what's going to happen is, first of all, we have a review of the fees that are being paid by the government to childcare providers, because I want this to be quality childcare. Second of all, we've got the increase from 15 to 30 hours, which will be of real benefit to working families. And third of all, we've got this new tax relief coming in, so if you spend up to £10,000, you get £2,000 back. What this will mean is that families under this government will have far greater choice on childcare, far greater resources sources on childcare, and they, rather like the Honourable Lady for Peckham, who said the other day, a greater number of people feel relieved that we're not in government. I suspect those parents will feel the same way. Yeah. He just can't help himself but gloat, can he? Go right.
straight ahead and gloat, but why shouldn't he just answer the question about childcare? We know, and perhaps we can have an answer rather than a gloating session for the next question. I'll try again. We know, we know that often grandparents help out. Most parents say they just couldn't manage without the grandparents. But increasingly, those grandparents are not retired, they are themselves working. So will the Prime Minister agree to look at how we can help grandparents get flexibility at work, like allowing them to share parental leave? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm certainly happy to look at that because the right to request flexible working is something that this government has championed. And I'm sorry if the right honourable lady uh, thinks I, I, I'm gloating. It must, be, um, it must be the first time someone's ever been accused of gloating while quoting the leader of the opposition. I, I, I mean, for instance, she said the other day... People tend to like a leader who, feel they, is, who, who they feel is economically competent. Yes. You know, I, I think she's been talking a lot of sense, and I'm going to be quoting her. I'm going to be quoting her as often as I possibly can. This is amazing. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was pleased to hear the announcement in our manifesto that there would be a review of business rates. Right. This is something that's come across loud and clear over the election period in St Albans. My businesses want some assistance with this. Through his good offices, can I ask that he will get the Chancellor to get a move on on this? I think it's so important for across the country and for good business. Yeah. Well, the Chancellor will have heard loud and clear my hon. <laughs> friend's instructions. What I'd say is that we... We do want to get on with this review of business rates, and uh, like all members in this House, I have listened and she would have listened to the complaints by high street stores who feel there's sometimes unfair competition with uh, internet re re retailers who don't face the same sort of business rates. But I would just give this warning. Business rates do raise a large amount of revenue and revenue that's necessary, and it's not going to be possible to come up with a review that will satisfy everybody. Mr Angus Robertson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, the UK remains in the top ten uh, amongst the most unequal societies in the world. Uh, helping people on low incomes receive the living wage can be transformational for them and their families. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity to praise all employers who deliver the living wage? Yeah. I'm very happy to praise all those employers who deliver the living wage. That has long been the Conservative position. It's set out in the manifesto. And I'm proud to say that, uh, as, as Prime Minister, and I hope this isn't gloating, number 10 is a minimum wage employer too, a living wage employer too. As I should point out to the Right Honourable Gentleman, is this House a living wage employer as well? Mr Angus Robertson. Uh, however, the Scottish Government is the only government in the UK as a whole that is an accredited living wage uh, employer. Could the Prime Minister tell us when he will ensure that all UK government departments, all agencies and all employees will receive the living wage? Yes. Well, we do want to make progress. Obviously, the Scottish Government has the advantages of the additional funding it's been getting under this uh, government. And I do notice... I do notice that consensus in the Scottish National Party is rather broken down over f full fiscal autonomy. It, uh, because, of course, if they got full fiscal autonomy, they probably wouldn't be able to afford to be a living wage employer. I've been following these things closely. The new Member of Parliament for East Lothian has called the policy economic suicide. Uh, the new Member of Parliament for Edinburgh East has called full fiscal autonomy a disaster. It seems to be that the Scottish National Party's new approach is to demand something they don't want and then to complain when they don't get it. <laughs> Mike Freer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Saturday, the 4th of July, on Saturday, the 4th of July, a far-right neo-Nazi group are planning a demonstration in Golders Green, an area with a large Jewish population. Would my right honourable friend agree with me and join with me in calling on the police to use all of their public order powers to combat this anti-Semitic demonstration? Yeah. 
I think my honourable friend speaks for the whole House, and I can tell him that the Home Secretary has recently written to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner about this specific demonstration and set out that where any criminal offences are committed and where individuals have demonstrated anti Semitic hostility, they should face the full force of the law. We do have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly in our country, but people should not feel free to, to extend to harassment or threatening behaviour. That is not permitted, and that should be prosecuted. Yes, sure. As a new MP, I am still wondering if the Prime Minister actually answered the question during oh. his question. Yeah. If, he, if, he, if he does, can he explain why my city of Bradford, which was the Northern Powerhouse, continues to be neglected in his regional plans? Well, well, first of all, on behalf of the whole House, can I welcome the Honourable Lady to her place? She replaces someone who had, uh, I think, a unique distinction of always speaking with immense power, but always being completely wrong. Um, and I'm sure that she will take uh, a, a different approach. What I would say to her about Bradford is that Bradford should be part of this northern powerhouse because the concept is linking up the great cities of the north of England and making the most of them. In terms of neglecting Bradford, I would say quite the opposite. If you look at the spending power per dwelling that her local authority has, it's actually almost £2,300. That is almost uh, £300 more than the average for England. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the long term economic plan yeah. is working in Worcestershire, yeah. which has the third fastest economic growth rate in England. And unemployment in my constituency is down 62% since 2010. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister agree that the further redoubling of the Cotswold line would add, uh, add additional economic benefits to my constituents and all those along the route? Yeah. My, um, first of all, can I congratulate my honourable friend for winning his uh, constituency? And can I say he has got off to a tremendous start by not only mentioning the long term economic plan, but also mentioning the railway line that goes straight through the middle of my constituency, um, which I, I uh, want to see the further redoubling of. So he's already my, best, uh, my new best friend. Um, he, he will know that we've got the, um, the intercity express trains planned to operate between London and Worcester from 2017. There will be new and updated trains planned for every part of the Great Western franchise. But where he's right is further investment in redoubling the railway between Oxford and Worcester really is necessary to deliver the extra services and the more reliable services that both his constituents and my constituents would like. Mark Durkin. As a backbencher, the Prime Minister campaigned on Group B strep awareness. Uh, I'm sure he is aware of the highly successful programme at Northwick Park of universal GBS uh, screening, which proves the very case that he used to make. Will he now encourage ministers to roll out GBS-specific testing as a routine offer to all pregnant women across all our health services? Can I say how grateful I am to the Honourable Gentleman for raising this, because it was two constituents, Craig and Alison Richards, who came to my surgery, who raised uh, this issue with me, which was got me interested in the whole area in the first place. We have made some big breakthroughs. That National Health Service does do much more in terms of screening and in terms of action to help those uh, potentially having uh, the infection of Group B strep. But there are issues and difficulties in terms of uh, national programmes because of the whole issue of antimicrobial resistance resistance and the use of antibiotics. But I'm very happy to take this opportunity to go back and look at what's been achieved so far, what more can be done, and to write to the Honourable Gentleman. Johnny Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. In my constituency of Plymouth Moorview, where the average wage is far lower than the national average, cutting the taxes of the lowest paid and helping them stand on their own two feet is the most effective poverty-tackling measure there is. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister explain how the Conservatives will reward hard work and benefit those earning the minimum wage, not only in Plymouth, but across the country? Well, well, first of all, can I 
welcome uh, my honourable friend to this place and praise him for his maiden speech, which I think moved all those who heard it or have subsequently read it. He's absolutely right that the best way to tackle poverty is to get people into work and then to make sure there's a decent minimum wage that rises over time and then to cut people's taxes by taking those earning minimum wage out of income tax. Our plan to raise the personal allowance to £12,500 will make a real difference, and I want to see progress on the minimum wage going at the same time as that. But all the while, we have to recognise that the absolute foundation is a growing economy that is producing jobs, is getting into work that is the greatest way to combat poverty. Dr Alan Whitehead. Can the Prime Minister reassure me that uh, press reports that he's going to be cutting funding support to household energy efficiency programmes are wrong and that instead he is committed to maintain support for programmes to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society have warm homes to live in? Well, we made some very big progress in the last Parliament in terms of home insulation programmes and in terms of supporting solar panels. I think we now have almost a million homes in the UK with those. We want to carry on with these programmes and make sure they get value uh, for money. Uh, I hope it won't be seen as gloating to welcome him back because he's quite a rare bird, which is a Labour MP in the south of England. Andrea Jenkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my constituency of Morley and Outward, yeah. one of the issues that is consistently blah blah blah. <laughs> one of the issues that is con- constantly raised on the doorstep is economic migration from within the EU. The government has already taken steps and clear action to reduce incentives, which draw, migra- which draw migrants from within the European Union. But could you tell me what further steps have been taken to tackle economic migration from outside the EU? Can I welcome the Honourable Lady to her place? I have to say that uh, her election result was one I was dreaming of. Um, And um, and, uh, and I'm very, very grateful for. Look, I think she's absolutely right to raise this issue. In the past, it has been frankly too easy for some businesses to bring in workers from overseas rather than to take the long-term decision to train our workforce here at home. Now, we need to do more to change that, and that means reducing the demand for migrant labour, and that is part of our plan. So I can tell the House today that the Home Secretary has written to the Migration Advisory Committee asking them to report back on how to significantly reduce work-related migration from outside Europe. They are going to advise on restricting our work visas to genuine skill shortages specialists. They are going to look at putting a time limit on how long a sector can claim to have a skills shortages, because frankly they should be dealing with it. We are going to look at a new skills levy on businesses who recruit foreign workers so we can boost the funding to UK apprenticeships. And We are also going to look at raising salary thresholds to stop businesses using foreign workers to undercut wages. All of these steps, combined with the measures that we are taking within the European Union, can help bring migration under control, but more to the point, make sure that hard-working British people who get the skills, who get the training, are, they have, can find the jobs that will help them to build a better life. Yeah. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Six young boys with the devastating disease muscular dystrophy will be in Downing Street this afternoon, supported by Muscular Dystrophy UK, to make a plea to the Prime Minister to help them ac- access the Duchenne drug Translana that they need now to stop them losing their mobility. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister make time to see them, and will he tell the House that these children can expect a positive answer that they so desperately need now? Yeah. Well, first of all, can I thank the Honourable Lady for raising this, because it is a terrible disease, and I hugely admire the courage shown by the sufferers and their families. Unfortunately, I won't be able to hold that meeting this afternoon, because I have to go from the statement after Prime Minister's question straight to an EU summit in Brussels. But I do remember meeting Archie Hill, who is one of the group, back in January. He's an amazing young boy, incredibly brave. And the situation is that NHS England has now completed a consultation on how it prioritises investment into these specialised services, including for drugs for rare conditions. This closed at the end of April. A decision can be expected in the near future. And I recognise how vital it is to give those affected and their families a decision as soon as possible. John McCartney. Thank you. 
Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Speaker. On Monday, <laughs> I attended the formal opening of the Magna Carta Centre in Lincoln, a oh, magnificent yeah. vault built to showcase Lincoln's original Magna Carta in its 800th at celebratory year within our city's beautiful castle. Yeah. Having himself visited Lincoln on various occasions, would the Prime Minister like to join me in recommending that other members and their constituents should visit Lincoln yeah. to see for themselves both our original Mag Magna Carta and our majestic cathedral, as well as Lincoln's myriad other attractions, especially as we move towards a new British Bill of Rights? Yeah. I think my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right to take this opportunity in this, the year, the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta, to advertise the fact that there is an original copy in the great city of Lincoln, and people can go and see that and see all the other advantages that Lincoln has to offer. But there's also not just a point about British history here. There are so many countries and so many people around the world that don't have the rule of law, that don't have protections against arbitrary arrest. And so that document, signed 800 years ago, is important not just in Britain, but important that we promote its values around the world. Morris. Most working people aspire to decent, sustainable jobs. Indeed, thousands of my constituents work at Nissan or in the automotive supply chain uh, in East Durham. So when will the Prime Minister publish the Treasury assessment of the cost to the British economy of withdrawal from the EU? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me praise the many hard-working constituents he has working in the Nissan factory uh, in the North East. Nissan is now producing more cars in the North East than the whole of the Italian car industry. It is a great example of the manufacturing renewal that's taking place in this country. Look, I'm ha I want the widest possible debate about Britain's future in Europe, and I would encourage all organisations to bring forward ideas and facts and figures so this debate can be informed. But above all, let's remember, it's not going to be a decision made by politicians, it's going to be a decision made by the British people. Yeah. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. If Northern Lincolnshire is to obtain maximum benefit from the uh, Northern Powerhouse Initiative, uh, further improvements to transport connections are required. One such improvement would be a direct rail service to uh, London King's Cross uh, from the Grimsby Cleethorpe Scunthorpe area. Alliance Rail have an application with the rail regulator, which has been with them for over a year. Could my right honourable friend do all he can to ensure that an early decision is made? Yeah. I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this, the importance of direct connectivity between his constituency uh, and London. We are investing at least £6.4 in Yorkshire and Northern Lincolnshire in this Parliament for that very reason. I can reassure my honourable friend that we are listening, and only late last year the Transport Secretary announced we will be retaining the direct connection between Cleethorpes and Manchester Airport, something that he has been campaigning for, and I will look very closely at what he said today. Mr Douglas Carswell. At the time of the Bloomberg speech, the Prime Minister promised that he would seek the repatriation of power from Brussels. Power, he said, must flow back to the member states. Social and employment <coughs> law, he specifically promised, would be returned to Britain. Why is he not even asking for this anymore? Well, first of all, can I welcome the Honourable Gentleman back to uh, this place? He's, uh, he's made some history because, uh, as, as a party of one, he's managed to have a backbench rebellion, which is um, <laughs> something to be admired. What I've set out in terms of the renegotiation is a whole series of things that need to change. Making sure we deal with the problem of ever closer union, making sure we deal with the issue of competitiveness, which, yes, does impinge on some of the issues under what was called the social chapter that have never been acceptable to the United Kingdom, making sure, and the chance will be setting out more detail of this this evening, that we have a better balance and proper fairness between those countries that are in the European, uh, in the Euro and those that are out of the Euro. All these areas in our negotiation and more are very important. Philip Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, just heard from the Honourable Member from Easington the ridiculous scaremongering we can yet get used to that if we were to leave the EU we would end free trade with the EU. Can the Prime Minister confirm that last year the UK had a. a can the, can the Prime Minister confirm that last year the UK had a £56 billion trade deficit with the European Union? And can he tell us whether in any of his discussions with Angela Merkel, she's indicated that if we were to leave the EU, she would want to stop trading BMWs, Mercedes, Volkswagens and Audis free of tariff into the UK? Yeah. 
Well, my, my honourable friend makes his case with his uh, characteristic vigour uh, and clarity. The only uh, issue that I would add into this is, of course, Britain's relationship with Europe is not just about a trading relationship, it is having a say over what the rules of the single market uh, actually are. And it's that that we're going to have to discuss and think about over these coming months before uh, the European referendum, is, is what is the difference between a trading relationship and actually having a say over the way a market works. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, under the Prime Minister, British productivity has plummeted yeah. 30% yeah. behind Germany, the yeah. US and France, yeah. the widest gap since 1992 and another Tory government. Yeah. But in the North East, thanks to our manufacturing and technical press, we have the highest productivity growth in the country. So isn't it time he gave us the powers we need to build an economy that matches our values without a Boris, I mean a moral attached? Well, well first of all, I, would, I think the Honourable Lady is absolutely right to raise this issue. There's a huge challenge in terms of raising productivity and the productive potential of the United Kingdom. Look, I'd be the first to say we've had the success of getting two million more people in work. We've had the success of paying down half the deficit and getting the economy growing, but the challenge for the years ahead is to increase levels of productivity in Britain. Now, how are we going to do that? I would argue we'll do that by reforming planning, by encouraging entrepreneurship, by making sure we invest in success, by investing in science. These are the things that we've been doing as part of a long-term economic plan, mostly opposed by the party opposite. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Any move to legalise assisted suicide is viewed with the utmost concern by disability groups and others who fear yeah, that yeah, it could yeah. pressurise the vulnerable into making decisions that are not in their best interests. Yeah, Would the yeah. Prime Minister inform the House of his view on this issue? Prime Minister. Well, on this issue, I agree very much with my honourable friend, which is I don't support um, uh, the assisted dying proposals that have come out of the other place. I don't support uh, euthanasia. Uh, I know there are imperfections and problems with the current law, but I think these can be dealt with sensitively and sensibly without having a new law that actually brings in euthanasia. And as she says, I think the problem is the pressure that is then put on frail elderly people to take a decision that actually they might not want to go ahead with. The Prime Minister will be aware of Tata Steel's decision to close the British Steel pension scheme. This will have a devastating impact upon steel workers and their families. Can I urge the Prime Minister again to demand that Tata get back around the negotiating table, re-engage with meaningful consultation with the trade unions, and stop Tata from playing fast and loose with their own employees' pensions? Well, of course, I hope that parties will return to the negotiating table to find a solution as quickly as possible. But ultimately, this is a matter for Tata Steel and for the trade unions, and I would urge them to do as, to do as I've said. Becca Powell. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, we need a country where every city, town, village, and indeed region benefits from the growing economy. Can the Prime Minister kindly explain how the measures in this Queen's speech will bring this about? But particularly in relation to my area, the South West, and even more particularly Taunton Dean, which I would like to make the gateway to the South West. Yeah. Well, what I'd say to my honourable friend, after congratulating her on her magnificent election victory, is that there, I think there are some very important infrastructure proposals that need to go ahead. For instance, the A358, which the party opposite pledged to cancel during the election campaign, making sure that expressway to the southwest is built, including the tunnel under Stonehenge. But I think crucially for Taunton and for the whole of the southwest is to make sure we deliver on our promises on high-speed broadband. This now, for businesses, is as important as being connected to the road or the rail network, and we've really got to make sure we get to those final businesses and homes that want to see high-speed broadband. And, uh, when is the Prime Minister handing the button to Boris? <laughs> Well, we, we benefit hugely from having uh, Boris's wisdom now back in this house. And um, the, baton, the baton that I'm interested in, in seeing is the moment at which Boris passes the baton to another Conservative Mayor of London. Mr Paul 
Paul Scully. Yeah. Yeah. Manor Park Primary School in Sutton has just received a well-deserved outstanding rating from Ofsted. But can they, my, my, my honourable friends, tell me how the new Education Act will benefit and improve all schools? Yeah. Well, I think what we should be doing is where schools get to outstanding, first of all, really singling them out and praising them because we want to see many more children taught in good or outstanding schools. Where we need to focus is on those schools that are either failing or coasting. And what the Education Bill in the gracious speech will do is make sure we intervene more quickly. Because, frankly, if you've got children at a state school, as I have, one extra term in a failing school is a term that is wasted. And we shouldn't let the bureaucracy get in the way of taking over failing schools and turning them around. Last but not least, Mr Peter Dowd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the High Court ruled that severe delays in assessing disabled people for benefits uh, were unlawful. Given this, will the Prime Minister personally take charge to ensure that these distressing delays don't happen again? Well, first of all, let me welcome the Honourable Gentleman on his uh, election and his arrival in this place. He's absolutely right to raise this issue. Some of the delays that have been uh, unacceptably long for people to get their new benefits, particularly when we're transitioning from disability living allowance to personal independence payments, those delays are coming down, and I give him my assurance that we'll keep on this and make sure the delays come down still further.